This video is brought to you by Squarespace, an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Hello, my beautiful devs. I know it's been a really long time, or it feels like a really long time since I last posted, but that's because I also went to Paris to work on a very specific project collaboration with a brand which I'm really excited to share with you guys later this month. That and like my classes started again. So yeah, things have just been kind of hectic on the home front, but um, I'm getting back to schedule. I'm not planning to go anywhere until the holiday season. And yeah, I'm really excited to just honestly be cooped up and celebrate the fall, which is my favorite month. You know, my favorite thing about the movie is like, it feels like a, like a movie. So today's video is inspired by the Don't Worry Darling drama that was happening earlier last month. The internet was pretty uh, inundated with this drama for like a couple weeks. Like every corner of the internet that I was on was talking about it in some form or another, whether it was memes, like the actual discourse or just conspiracy theories. But because we as a culture like to move on to the next thing at light speed, which I think the next Hollywood thing that everyone's been talking about is the new Blonde movie, which I hate to say it, I hate to say it, but I was right and I warned you all and some people booed me for it, but I knew it was going to be a shit show and that seems to be what's coming out about this movie. So I haven't watched it. I don't know if I'm going to because... Yeah, I digress. That is, seems to be the the big discourse right now. So to recap what was happening last month with Don't Worry Darling. Don't Worry Darling is Olivia Wilde's second directorial film. It's out in theaters now. It stars Florence Pugh and Harry Styles. Yes, the next question would be, can Harry Styles act? Um, honestly, you be the judge. Not everyone gets this opportunity. And if you keep talking like this, you're gonna put it all at risk. Our life, Alice, our life together. This, we could lose this. So in August, Wilde told Variety that Shia LaBeouf was supposed to be the lead role, but she fired him because his process was not conducive to the ethos that she demands in her productions. Shia then refuted her statement and said he left on his own accord and publicized all these receipts too, including a video of Olivia trying to reconcile with him to make the production work and referring to Florence Pugh shadily as Miss Flo. Shia, Shia, Shia. I just went riding my horse, very sweaty, but I wanted to reach out because I feel like I'm not ready to give up on this yet. And I too am heartbroken and I want to figure this out and you know I think this might be a bit of a wake-up call for Miss Flo and I want to know if you're open to giving this a shot with me with us if she really commits if she really puts her her mind and heart into it at this point there have been a lot of speculation about Florence and Olivia not getting along on set um, and a lot of the speculation is because Florence was not promoting this movie at all even though she was initially very excited to be on the project before filming started. But behaviors at the Venice Film Festival made everything pretty clear in my opinion. For example, Florence chose to skip the press event instead rocking up to Venice in a Valentino fit holding an Aperol spritz iconic moment if you ask me. That's just kind of like the main event, but there were other things like Florence avoiding eye contact with Olivia at the Venice premiere, Florence's stylist writing the Instagram caption Miss Flo under a picture of Florence, and Florence uh, leaving early so that the applause had to stop. <laughs> So I, as far as I know, we never got to the bottom of why they were allegedly uh, not getting along, but some conspiracy theories were floating around. Some people said it's because Olivia and Harry were being unprofessional and showing up late to set. Um, some say it's because Florence and Olivia's ex-husband Jason Sudeikis are friends. But regardless, the fact that the internet was so enraptured by this three-person drama for like weeks is a testament to how entertaining celebrity gossip can be. Especially when it's stupid, like the whole 
idea that Harry Styles purposely spit on Chris Pine and Chris Pine's um, agent or publicist had to come forward and be like, yeah, that didn't happen. That's not true. <laughs> so for this video, um, we're mostly going to be talking about the history of celebrity scandals in Hollywood and also what it's like today and also something very new that is happening in this video that has never happened before is I'm inviting a guest to come speak about this, a surprise guest, and you'll just have to tune in to see who it is. Once again, thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you don't know where to start, Squarespace has a bunch of website templates and if none of them match your vibe, you can add customizations like different fonts, colors, and images. You can also easily open your own store on Squarespace to sell anything from physical products to memberships. If you're offering a service that requires appointment booking, Squarespace also offers a scheduling feature to make it easy for any clients to book a time with you. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. First of all, humans are naturally interested in gossip. I don't care what anyone says. This is just the truth of the matter. Um, I definitely have had some friends in the past who were like, I don't gossip and like, you know, have that whole holier than thou attitude. But the truth of the matter, the fact of the matter is that everyone does it. Some people just don't recognize that they're doing it because it doesn't have to be malicious. Case in point, despite being stereotyped as a woman thing, psychologists Jeffrey G. Parker and Stephanie D. Teasley actually found that boys and girls engage in similar amounts of gossip. So just to clear on the air, what is the definition of gossip? According to researchers at the University of California, Riverside, who studied the nuances of gossip, gossip in the academic's view is not bad. It's simply talking about someone who isn't present. That talk could be positive, neutral, or negative. Gossip has a pretty bad reputation for skewing towards the negative, but in a 2019 meta-analysis analyzing 467 subjects, on average, most of the gossip the subjects partook in on a daily basis was actually deemed neutral and boring. But gossip is a pretty positive behavior regardless of what you're actually talking about um, because it staves off loneliness, creates closeness, and serves as a form of entertainment. According to York Bergman, the primary function of gossip is to generate a sense of intimacy and connection between gossipers through the creation of shared meaning about their shared world. Researchers at University of California, Berkeley, found that gossip can also help lower stress levels. In terms of celebrity gossip, aka gossip that circulates the lives of the rich and famous, Karen Sternheimer says, Celebrity stories can help us make sense of our identities, not simply by telling us how we should look, feel, think, or act, but through a social process of negotiation. For instance, in the 1950s, a lot of women latched onto celebrity stories like Marilyn Monroe having difficulty conceiving a child as a vehicle to discuss their own personal ideals and struggles surrounding fertility and childbirth. Gossip media has traditionally taken the form of gossip columns and tabloids, but more recently has evolved into Instagram accounts like Demois, more on that later, and TikTok story times. I like to really understand the gossip industry. We really have to start from the beginning. Salacious stories about the rich and famous have been a concept for a while now. For example, historians have looked at cuneiform tablets from the 15th century BCE, which discuss the allegations that a Mesopotamian mayor was committing adultery with a married woman. There were also a few local group columns throughout the 18th century that people think inspired Lady Whistledown's character from Bridgerton, such as Mrs. Crackenthorpe, who penned the female tattler from 1709 to 1710 in England. In terms of the commercial publication of gossip in the U.S., that really spiked in the 1830s with the birth of the penny press during the Industrial Revolution. Penny press newspapers were cheap, mass-produced newspapers. They famously costed only a cent to buy and therefore made news way more accessible to the middle and lower classes. At this time, printed gossip was salacious, but they were mostly pulled from official records such as court documents and arrest records. It was Walter Winchell who's often credited with inventing the modern gossip column. Winchell's column first appeared in the 1920s in the newspaper New York Graphic. His column mixed in official sources with unofficial information regarding pregnancies, divorces, and liaisons. 
Because Winchell's column was so successful, other newspapers across the country started to write their own gossip columns. Also something to add, it might be hard to believe now because tabloids and gossipers get such a bad rep these days, but in the early 20th century, gossip columnists were like highly regarded newspaper journalists. At his peak in the 1940s, Winchell reached about 90% of the American public through his columns and radio broadcasts and was said to be one of the most powerful men in the world. These gossip columnists were also an essential part of the Hollywood studio system. Studio execs were aware that a good feature could increase the appeal of their stars, which would then drive profits at the theaters. Two women specifically, Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons, were reputable writers who had a symbiotic relationship with the studios. They would get the inside scoop on stars as long as they didn't antagonize the studio moguls. They were also fierce rivals and always fighting for scoops. For example, when Joan Crawford married Philip Terry in 1948, she told Luella first, which infuriated Hedda. Hedda telephoned Crawford soon after, saying, I will ruin you. When Joan ran into Hedda at a Hollywood party, she apparently begged for forgiveness, but Hedda just walked away. In the early 20th century, gossip columns were actually also featured in reputable newspapers, while fan magazines, which were general pop culture magazines like Cosmopolitan, which came out in 1886, and Photoplay, which came out in 1911, were notorious for being pretty sanitized when it came to celebrity coverage. There were gossip columnists who wrote for these celebrity magazines, such as Photoplay's Cal York, but generally, these columns were still free of any innuendo and seldom revealed any, like, breaking news facts about the stars. Anthony Slide writes, The most famous of the gossip columnists active in the newspaper world could be found within the pages of the fan magazine, but their contributions were generally lightweight, often in reality written by staffers, and very obviously secondary to and probably based on the items found in their daily outlets. So these articles were so sanitized that even major scandals such as the deaths of actress Thelma Thought and Paul Byrne were pretty much ignored or just mentioned in a few sentences. It was the newspapers that Americans could get their cup of tea for the day. Gossip columnists in the papers covered everything from the 1922 murder of William Desmond Taylor, a famed film director, to the 1921 and 1922 trials of Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, a popular silent film star and comedian who was tried for the murder of actress model Virginia Rappay. Speaking of these incidents, one of the reasons why the Hayes Code, otherwise known as the Hollywood Production Code, you know, the reason why a lot of these old Hollywood movies were heavily censored, um, one of the main reasons why this code was enacted in the first place was because of all the crime and scandals happening in Hollywood in the 1920s. That and the fact that a lot of Hollywood moguls were Eastern European Jewish immigrants, which didn't sit right with um, America's anti-Semitic viewpoints. Catholic and other religious organizations were staging like theater exits and walkouts um, and protests because they believed Hollywood was pushing these movies that were full of sin. So all in all, Hollywood producers thought that if they put their own production code in, that would give them more freedom than having an outside, you know, government body coming in and inserting a code for them. But well, let's fast forward to The Birth of Confidential, one of the most notorious gossip magazines of the 20th century. Confidential was founded by Robert Harrison in 1952. Harrison was actually inspired by Walter Winchell himself and wanted to offer readers behind-the-scenes stories and gossipy facts. Harrison once said, People like to read about things they don't dare do themselves, and if you can print these things about public figures, so much better. After only five years of publication, Confidential sold nearly four million copies of each issue, making it the best-selling magazine on American newsstands. Hollywood, of course, was horrified by these stories, and multiple celebrities filed lawsuits against Confidential, including Maureen O'Hara, Liberace, and Errol Flynn. However, most celebrities, even if they had an issue with Confidential, were afraid of suing because they felt that if they were, you know, if they took the magazine to court, they would either have to come out with a full story about, you know, whatever scandal they were involved in, or they would have to verify whether that scandal was actually true or not. Eventually, the heads of six major studios got together to file a lawsuit against the magazine, pleading to Attorney General Edmund Brown for help. In May 1957, Brown and the state of California indicted Confidential Harrison and its contributors, charging them with conspiracy to commit criminal libel. 
Harrison then hired private detective Fred Otash to subpoena mega stars, including Clark Gable, Frank Sinatra, and Mike Todd. But as the court date got nearer, all these stars started fleeing from Hollywood because they did not want to show face at the trial for reasons I just mentioned. In the end, uh, the jury was deadlocked and Harrison was financially wiped out, having spent $400,000 on Confidential's defense. Rather than push for another trial, he decided to reach a plea bargain. Brown would drop all charges if Confidential would only publish flattering stories about celebrities. After several celebrity-friendly articles were published, uh, the public was bored and confidential sales plummeted and Harrison eventually sold the magazine. But in general, I do want to say that the law typically sides with the press because in 1964, the Supreme Court ruled that in order to make a libel or defamation claim, a celebrity must prove that a news publication knew the information was false and published it anyway, thereby acting with actual malice. But around the same time, a lot of newspapers that carried gossip columns were folding as well. In late 1962, the printer strike killed a number of New York newspapers, including the New York Mirror, which was Winchell's main paper at the time. Um, Luella's hometown outlet, the Los Angeles Examiner, folded the same year as well. Most towns were left with one newspaper now, and because of this lack of competition, editors felt the freedom um, that they hadn't had before. They no longer had to depend on these salacious headlines to get readers, so most of them pivoted to delivering more like serious news. And then People Magazine came along in 1973. People, a Time Inc. paper, came out when life folded and was headed by Dick Stoley and exploited what Stoley called OPP, Other People's Problems. The magazine started as a feel-good publication, but by the late 1970s was filled with stars' traumatic stories, such as Karen Carpenter and her anorexia, Drew Barrymore and her drug problems, and Fair Fawcett's divorce. These stories inevitably encouraged readers to sympathize with featured celebrities. But Jeanette Walls explains what really set the magazine apart. People's greatest innovation was packaging tabloid content in an upscale package with the imprimatur of a reputable publisher. Around the same time, publicists were finally getting their share of the Hollywood power. For the first half of the 20th century, publicists were mostly pleading to these gossip columnists to get features about their stars because at the time, the philosophy was celebrities needed the press. But in 1971, Pat Kingsley, a Hollywood publicist, and two partners formed Pickwick Public Relations, which later became PMK. And by 1980s, the Hollywood environment had changed. There were more TV shows and publications that needed movie stars than there were movie stars to begin with. So Kingsley started withholding her clients, only allowing features if they were offering the best coverage and the most flattering photography. Some publicists were even using blackballing tactics to make sure that only favorable stories were coming out about their clients. Writer Stephanie Mansfield, who did a story on Tom Cruise in 1992 for GQ, claimed to be a victim. After talking to Tom for an hour and a half, she felt he was aloof and not easy to read. I don't know much about Tom Cruise other than the fact that he's a Scientologist, this like photo of Nicole Kidman post-divorcing him, and Christian Bale using him as a model to uh, create his character for American Psycho. Pilot, that if we turn the oxygen off in the back guy, that we could make it at this altitude. <laughs> So I feel like, given that context, aloof to me sounds pretty flattering. But coincidentally, soon after the interview, Stephanie was connected with Tom's former high school classmate and interviewed her as well. Despite this classmate being allegedly very positive about Tom, uh, Pat Kingsley, when she heard about this, was very upset. And according to Stephanie, she said, and this is a direct quote, Tom is going to be around for a long time. And I'm sure that you wanna be around in your business for a long time. I said, Pat, I don't know what you're driving at. She made it very clear that if I used any of this interview from this young girl, I would be blacklisted from her clients. Pat Kingsley has defended herself saying, I've been in the business too long to threaten someone. What I did say is that it would be a long time before I would subject a client to an interview by her. <laughs> so to give an understanding of how powerful publicists became, in 1993, Vanity Fair had agreed to put Andy McDowell, a PMK client, on the cover. But then a last minute interview with Bill Clinton came through. Magazine editors were so scared about how PMK would react if they pulled Andy's cover story, they ended up printing two versions of the magazine, one with Bill and one with Andy. 
This is not to say that tabloids completely died and publicists were fully controlling the narrative of what was going on about their stars. There were still like less reputable press channels that were hounding stars, taking upskirt photos, um, stalking them. If the death of Princess Diana, harassment towards Pamela Anderson and Britney Spears public breakdown have anything to show, it's that the power of the media can still affect a celebrity detrimentally with or without a publicist to protect you. I would like for them to leave me alone. So in the 2000s, we got the rise of the 24-hour news cycle and TMZ was founded in 2005. Cell phones became a daily part of life, which made accessing news possible at any time. Gossip blogs like Perez Hilton, Socialite Rank, Laney Gossip, Crazy Days and Nights, The Shade Room, and Blind Gossip were highly trafficked sites that posted mostly rumors about celebrities with little fact-checking. However, that's not to say that they never had a breaking story. On July 16th, 2012, Crazy Days and Nights published a blind item titled The Actress Who Loves a Child Monster. A blind item is a news story that keeps the identities of the people involved anonymous. This blind item referred to the actress as a B-list actress. The man was described as loving women and teens, and the actress apparently knew about her boyfriend's taste, defended him, and even recruited another B-list actress into a threesome. Six months after this initial post, the site republished this entry with the list of names. Allison Mack, Kristen Crook, Keith Rainier. Six years after this blind item was posted, Keith Rainier was charged for his role in leading a cult-like group called NXIVM that was engaged in sex trafficking, identity theft, extortion, forced labor, money laundering, and wire fraud. Another example, in 2012, Gawker, which was originally a gossip blog before it got relaunched in 2021, blogged about Louis C.K.'s sexual misconduct allegations, which was five years before the New York Times covered it. And then in 2017, Laney Gossip founder Elaine Liu told Fox that in regards to Harvey Weinstein's sexual abuse, for the 15 years that I've been reporting, that's how long I've been hearing about it. I think even though a lot of these publications um, tended to be very misogynistic, uh, body shaming, slut shaming, um, not being associated with a legacy media like the New York Times or Vanity Fair allows them to post whatever crazy story without fear of getting blackballed by the industry. Especially if it's a site that allows anonymous submissions because I can imagine a lot of people in the industry knew what Harvey Weinstein was doing but felt like they couldn't put a story out about it because he was such a powerful man at the time. So tablets have been declining since the 2000s and celebrity gossip blogs have also been kind of like fading. A lot of people chalk this up to the widespread use of social media and the fact that celebrities now have a direct channel to talk to their audiences. As Joseph Longo writes for Mel Magazine, we're in an era where ingenue actresses and celebrity power couples can control their own narratives and interact with fans on Twitter and Instagram. They don't need million dollar people pregnancy announcements or paparazzi photos at Saddle Ranch to gain attention. Some celebrities have also taken to social media to talk about how the gossip media and tabloids and press have negatively affected their mental health. Meghan Markle and Constance Wu have discussed how insults and ridicule have led them to suicidal thoughts and even actions. Taylor Swift also spoke about how having photos taken of her every single day negatively impacted her body image and her relationship with food. I think it's always a positive thing to gain multiple perspectives about a certain, you know, issue. Like, I think it's actually really good that celebrities have this ability to speak and to defend themselves and, um you know, share what they're actually going through because it does humanize them in a sense. But on the flip side, I think because celebrities now have this mouthpiece, it can discourage a lot of writers from writing the kinds of stories they want to write about them in fear of getting attacked by stands. And I don't know, this is like one of those things where I don't think like a celebrity is necessarily at fault for having stands, but it is just the reality of stand culture. Though I will say sometimes celebrities do like incite their stands. For instance, in September 2021, Nicki Minaj posted the phone numbers of two reporters on her Instagram story with the words, bitch, your days are fucking numbered, you dirty hoe. 
So the context of this is that these journalists were trying to contact Nikki's cousin's friend who allegedly got swollen balls as a side effect of the COVID vaccine and who was the reason why Nikki was not getting the vaccine herself. As a result, uh, Nikki doxed them on her story and these journalists were getting inundated with spam calls and death threats. The other downside with celebrities having this like platform is that it gives this mirage of authenticity when in reality, most of their social media channels are still like heavily monitored by PR, unless of course they decide to forego that and publish something completely out of left field. Like, I don't know, Sydney Sweeney publishing a Twitter note about her Blue Lives Matter family that didn't go too well. I've been saying that tabloids have been falling out of favor for a long time now. They still exist. Like you can go to any supermarket and find them close to the cash register. But it's actually pages like Dumois and comments by celebs and overheard celebs on Instagram, which are the up and coming hottest sources of celebrity gossip today. These pages mostly rely on user submissions, which invite audiences to not just observe, but participate. The New York Times writes, what Dumois tends to post and what readers seem to gravitate towards are anodyne stories that usually go unreported by magazines like People and US Weekly. How does an actor respond when someone asks him for a picture? What does a pop star say to a flight attendant on a transatlantic flight? The anonymous founder of Dumois explains her approach. It's almost like the anti-gossip gossip. That part of my account was always supposed to be a little bit satirical, making fun of the people that take gossip so seriously. Like all kinds of media, every little snippet of gossip needs to be taken with a grain of salt. So usually, even if the stories aren't true, they're usually harmless enough where it wouldn't affect someone's career. For example, um, Dumois posted that Leonardo DiCaprio apparently really enjoys having sex with his headphones on. I don't think he's going to lose any of his um, upcoming roles because of that little bit floating around on the internet. Other changes I've noticed about the celebrity gossip industry is that people are way more skeptical about whether something is a publicity stunt. Of course, PR stunts aren't new. They've existed since like the old Hollywood days. In 1920, Harry Reckenbach, a publicist known for staging sensational publicity stunts, hired an actor to rent a room in New York's Hotel Belle Claire under the name T.R. Zan. So the story goes that Mr. Zan suspiciously requested 10 pounds of raw steak. The hotel staff found out that that steak was for a lion cub that he was keeping in the hotel room. The police and press arrived at the scene and Mr. T. Arzan explained to them that the lion would appear at the opening of an upcoming movie, The Return of Tarzan. I think the difference now between a lot of these PR stunts of the early 20th century and PR stunts now is that PR stunts of today are way more elusive. Like, it's not really clear whether something is a publicity stunt or if it's something that's actually true. Um, the best example I can think of is PR relationships. Like, I don't think anyone in a PR relationship has ever come forward that their relationship was a PR relationship. And I think in general what's happening recently is that there's a lot of skepticism about celebrities um, and, the level of on this author and the level of authenticity that they show. It's just like I think the pandemic that really put celebrity culture in the red because the amount of tone deaf behaviors, the partying, the private jets, the vacations when everyone else was in lockdown. I don't think I need to bring up the Imagine video or Ellen's comment about how self quarantining felt like being in a jail. But you know, I just did anyway. So this was just kind of like the basic rundown of celebrity gossip. Now I want to bring on our special guest and I think she'll offer some really interesting insights for the rest of us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Shannon, aka Fluently Forward Online. Can you explain a little bit about your uh, Fluently Forward? Yes. Yeah. I have a branding. podcast and um, accounts called Fluently Forward, and we basically talk about different like celebrity gossip. So we cover a lot of blind items about celebrities, and then we kind of tie the blind items into like actual 
real world scandals to see if they match up um, and see if we can kind of see like some of these open secrets in Hollywood. Do blind items reveal it? And a la Epstein or Harvey Weinstein, can we find out about these things that are happening like two years before the public does? Do you think that celebrities have the right to privacy? I think they have the right to privacy in um, I don't know, any situation where it's like deeply personal to them and they're not, for example, like giving out any information about it. So something that people talk a lot about, or at least in my world, is the whole theory of, is Taylor Swift bisexual? Who are these songs really about? And I think you can speculate anything about a song that someone puts out because it's information that's out there. But if you're digging through their trash to find something, if you're paparazzi through their windows to get evidence of who they're with, I think that's unethical. But I think if it's anything that the celebrity releases themselves, you can speculate and gossip and make like, you know, conjectures about that stuff. So do you think paparazzi photos are inherently unethical? I think so. I mean, the paparazzi have like killed people. So I just think that's a little bit sketchy. But then it is weird, right? Because if Dumois has a blind item about, you know, oh, I saw this couple walking on the street just because the photo wasn't taken by a paparazzi, does that mean that it is ethical? I don't really know. Yeah, that's actually something that I've been thinking about because I started following Dumois. So I've been seeing like all their like Sunday recaps. And I always think like, I'd be really creeped out if someone took a photo of me just randomly eating like a hamburger at a restaurant. I'm sure Um, that has happened to you before. Oh, God. (laughs) No, I guess not that I would know. Yeah. Um, But, you know, like, Dumas is such, like, a huge platform that it's, like, what, like, a million people are seeing you at, like, this very un, like, glamorous (laughs) moment. And celebrities have spoken out about it. I think Hailey Bieber said that she didn't want to be in any of the Sunday Spotted, and she hasn't been since. Oh, okay. So So sometimes, yeah, they do. request to opt out? I guess so. She kind of changed the game. Hailey Bieber is, like, very (laughs) quick to say when she doesn't like something. This is, like, something that's kind of related to Dumois, but not really. But do you remember when that video of Ian Summerholder came out where... Wait, do you not know who that is? Oh, I know. The vampire. Yeah, the vampire. <laughs> the sexy vampire. Yeah. Or at least when I was 12, I thought he was a sexy vampire. Yeah. Um, but there was, like, a video that went viral. Yeah. Hey, guys, listen. No, no, stop. Everybody listen. I love you guys. I'm not taking a single photo today. It's my day. Don't follow us, please. I love you guys. You're so good to us. You're so awesome. No, that's not just one. Hey, I'm right here. This, this oh my but you guys don't follow us, please. I love you guys. Do not follow us, okay? It's too much. And then that video went viral, and then all these people were like, oh my god, he's so ungrateful. Like, he's like the worst person ever. Um, hates his fans. Which I think that's like an example where I pretty much side with Ian but Mm. in just like an instance for Dumas where someone's like oh this person didn't want to take a photo with me the way that they write it is like this person's like a terrible person they're really mean to their fans whereas like they might just not have wanted to take a photo that day um and in that sense I feel like it's sometimes really sad or like kind of dangerous to just like depend on like this one snapshot of a person's life to make like a judgment about who they are as a character. And I think sometimes Dumois does like foster that. Yes, yeah. Sometimes the tea is just little snippets and little snippets doesn't make up someone's personality, but I think something was going on with um Conan O'Brien recently. And I'm blocked by Dumois, but I saw it on the subreddit. So <laughs> It was a blind about how Dumois um, or how Conan O'Brien stole muffins at a hotel and brought it to his family. And this is the only bad things that's existed for years about Conan O'Brien. And it could also be a fake story. Nobody knows. But everyone's now like, wow, Conan O'Brien stole those muffins. And what they don't take into account is that there's one tiny negative story about him. But how do you add up all of the years of no negative stories? So that'll be the same thing, right? Like, Dylan O'Brien um, seems a little bit grumpy when he was getting coffee and uh, nudged me as he walked by. Okay, that's one negative point, but where are all of the people to say, he was great to me, he took a photo, he donated, he did this. So when we live in this world of just gossip and scandals, something that I really like is on Crazy Days and Nights, they have kindness blinds. So you'll see you know, maybe 10 different items about a celebrity being rude, but who's shouting out all of their charity work, right? Who's shouting right. out all of the gifts that they did send to fans so it it seems a little bit uneven when people are on gossip threads looking for reasons to hate someone because you're always going to find it do you do you remember when that um uh, adamson ray's dad's girlfriend like yes. the toilet seat liquor like 
<laughs> yes. Um, and how she spread that story about Jeffree Star and Kanye West. Or I don't think she, like, specifically used their names. Like, it was, like, a blind item, right, on TikTok. Yeah. And for some reason, people were flooding the comments with, like, oh, it's Jeffree Star and Kanye. And I remember that being on my Twitter feed for, like, 48 hours. It gave us um, some good memes. But that Leah Michelle not being able to read, sometimes <laughs> rumors do get solidified as fact, and they're completely false. Yeah, yeah or Harry Styles being balls. That one I'm so-so on. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some photos. I've seen some photos of that hair really flipping around. I don't think he's, like, fully bald. Like, I think yes. he has, like, a toupee that he yeah. wears, <laughs> like, to add some volume. Me but... too. <laughs> Me too. To bring some hair to the front, but yeah. I don't think he's like fully like. You yes, know, um, I don't think he's a he's he doesn't have a Mr. Clean type of head, but I <laughs> I think he also doesn't have like a Chewbacca situation. Yeah, he's not like luscious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess kind of being related to all that, is there a scandal that you thought was not scandal worthy that made all these headlines? I guess the one that's true. Yeah, <laughs> I have to say I'm still so confused by donut gate with ariana grande <laughs> i think um you know licking a donut probably not the best thing to do but i think it's also not a sin at mm. least when i went to ccd it wasn't and that was just such a tiny thing that blew up and maybe because of the absurdity of it but i have to be honest i was kind of fine with the fact that she licked a donut do you think that the way like we even use the term scandal like in our lexicon is bad just the fact that that could encase like two completely different extremes you know someone committing like terrible crimes versus someone just like doing something like absurd in public i think that all the time and i especially think that with women and men right mm -hmm. and chrissy teigen massively canceled she tweeted something horrible to a girl she's tweeted some wild things over the years Shia LaBeouf was abusive to his ex-girlfriend, has been domestically abusive to so many people throughout the years. He's still starring in movies. His mm -hmm. cancellation kind of ebbs and flows. Same with Chris Brown. So I do think that sometimes men in Hollywood commit actual crimes and they're scandals. And then women in Hollywood will lick a donut or tweet something and they get canceled with the same ferocity, which is just crazy to me. Again, you even see it in cheating scandals, right, too, when there's three women involved. Um, the Instagram model that exposed Adam Levine, so much vitriol mm -hmm. towards her. Adam Levine got a few memes, you know what I mean? Right. Or um, Jordan Woods will forever be associated with the Khloe Kardashian, um, Tristan Thompson scandal. Tristan kind of got, he's still on the show. He's still involved with the family, mm -hmm. but Jordan is forever excommunicated. So I feel like whenever there is a scandal, we do typically give more flack to the woman than the man. Do you think that there's ever going to be a moment where that changes? Because I don't know, for <laughs> me, like I thought we were moving in a progressive sense. Okay, for example, like Monica Lewinsky, I feel like she has been looked on more favorably over the years, like since the initial like Bill Clinton issue. But then at the flip side, like I felt like a lot of the Olivia Wilde discourse was misogynistic. The Adam Levine um, discourse was misogynistic. And it just like leaves me going, what is going on with the world? Like, where are we going? Yeah, I mean, I think that we, we like to think we've gotten better. I think if the Monica Lewinsky situation happened today, we would still give Monica Lewinsky so much grief. Mm -hmm. But I do think maybe it's a mixture of sexism but i think it's also a mixture of ageism so i think a lot of times if you see a scandal with three women and this didn't happen with jordan woods as much but you'll be like oh well the woman did this and she's a full-grown woman so she should have known better mm. but i think typically when we are i think getting better in today's culture talking about power balances and different power dynamics so i think if monica Lewinsky happened today we would be better about it because there was such a clear power dynamic and an age difference, but I think she would still get a lot of grief because she's a woman. Right. Yeah. I guess, like, in terms of age, do you think that there's a strict cutoff for, like, when someone is can sort of, like, evade scandal for being too young to know better? I think maybe if you're under the age of 21, it's a little bit easier. I'm just thinking of Adam Levine's Instagram girlfriend, who I think yeah. was, like, 22. Yeah. And everybody was like, she's a full-grown woman, but Olivia Rodrigo is 19. She's a child. Yeah, so. I got so much flack because I tried to defend Adam Levine's mistress. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but I did yeah. it on Twitter, which is probably the worst platform to do that because I was yeah. like... Uh, why don't we talk about the fact that there was a 20 age like uh, age gap between the two and the fact that there's like a literal celebrity sliding into your DMs like I mean I don't want to incriminate myself but like I don't know what I would do if someone 
who was really big and famous and I was like young and just out of college and I didn't have much going well, I don't want to say she has nothing going on but you know what I mean <laughs> like you know you're so at the beginning of your career yeah um like I don't know how I would particularly respond in that sense and I don't know if it was like necessarily fair to like pile onto her when there is that power imbalance like even though she could have said no I guess or like ignored him but also I think what a lot of people fail to realize is Adam Levine was probably lying to her Mm. if he's lying to his wife and he's been serially cheating on her for years he's probably also lying to the affair partners that's what cheaters do Mm -hmm. so I think people blame all of these women right Bill Clinton probably said to Monica Lewinsky oh, our marriage is just one of convenience. And Tristan probably said to Jordan Woods, oh, Chloe and I are just together for the TV show. And Adam Levine probably said to Sumner, Beati and I are in an open relationship. Everyone is in Hollywood is. That's just how it works. And he probably spun some sort of tale, and I think that's what happens. And uh, people just immediately view these affair partners as villainous people who must have been in on it. Mm -hmm. They were probably getting tricked too. Maybe not to the same degree, but a little bit. I don't know if you've read um, this article that Rain Fisher Kwan did called, like, Being, like, women mm. And this, like, whole phenomenon of being, like, canceled as a woman just because you're, like, popular. I've seen popular. about it, yeah. Kind of like how Jennifer Lawrence and, like, Anne Hathaway, um, do you think someone else is going to be the next woman to be womaned? I think Doja Cat got a little bit womaned, a little bit. I think anytime you're like a relatable female celebrity who's being funny or quirky or something like that, you're at the risk of being womaned. Amy Schumer has tried to come back and she got womaned <laughs> out again. Um, but yeah, and and I I think too that the phrases they use are, well, she gives me a weird vibe or mm-hmm. I've always gotten this sort of energy or sense from her. And it's just kind of like a polished linguistic form of bullying like you're being rude but you want to have the moral high ground so instead of saying oh I just don't like this girl you go "Mm, she seems toxic like there's Mm -hmm. something about her because you don't want to admit to yourself "Ah, I just don't like her for whatever reason (laughs) you see that too with Sydney Sweeney where I think she attend she has conservative family members Mm -hmm. and I don't think she stated anything about her politics but the association with that is now Sydney Sweeney is forever problematic you know Mm -hmm. deemed with this paintbrush so once you have that like check mark against your reputation, that reputation follows you around anywhere. If anyone yeah. ever has a thread, oh, you know, what do we know about Sydney Sweeney? That's always going to come up forever. Mm-hmm. And people just kind of carry this like receipt of past problems with them if you're a celebrity. I also think, particularly with Sydney Sweeney, it's like she's a white girl who grew up in a pretty rural area of Washington, I don't Somewhere know. in the South. I feel like I could tell you that her family, like she has pretty conservative family members. And I think if we held that standard for every person that we're friends with too, like I wouldn't have any white friends probably. Like I kind of already know going into it that like I might not vibe with every member of your family, but that doesn't mean you're not like a decent person. Okay, I do like this question, but it would just be really random for me to say right now. (laughs) Do you think in general PR teams of like the 2020s or late 2010s have been doing a good job to deal with this like influx of cancellation and scandal? Okay, I just want to clarify because I have very complicated thoughts on cancel culture. Like I think a lot of the times uh, usually right-wing people tend to conflate what cancel culture means and for the most part most people who have been involved in a scandal have not been canceled in the sense where their career is over um when i talk about a cancellation i think of a cultural cancellation this doesn't even have to be widespread because um a lot of the times the hatred and vitriol that certain celebrities get is very contained on twitter or TikTok, but this is definitely still like a phenomenon, even if it's small scale, because it is something that has arisen in the age of technology. And it's something that um, has affected a number of different celebrities. It's hard to tell. Sometimes they do feel so out of touch. Like when the Sydney Sweeney thing happened, so many people were saying, oh, she talked about paying so much for her PR team. Where are they now? Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes a PR tactic is... Um, uh, what's it called? Like the the Streisand effect. Sometimes you don't want to address a scandal because then that only makes people hone in on it more. And it's also hard to tell since we're so online. 
what is a true scandal and then what's just a scandal because it's on our specific for you page on TikTok. Right. So for example, my mom probably has no idea about the Try Guys. Um, <laughs> my dad probably has no idea that Leah Michelle can't read. So there's some like scandals and cancellations that people think are a huge deal, but it's actually not if you poll like all of America and who's seen movies and TV shows. It's not just our core group of people on TikTok. It's everyone across America. So do you think it's better, like, if you're a celebrity and you got, you know, say, you know, like, Sydney Sweeney, what happened to her? Do you think it's better to say something and address the situation or just, you know, pretend it never happened? I'd say there's probably a formula. I would say everyone probably doesn't want to address it for the first 36 hours. But then if it blows up into something huge, you decide do I put out a tweet? Do I do X, Y, Z? And it's funny how people address it on their least viewed platform. (laughs) So like David Dobrik used his second YouTube channel to address his allegations or Sydney Sweeney responded in a tweet when really all of the photos that caused this were on her Instagram. So it's funny how celebrities are like, okay, I'll pick a medium that a lot of people won't see, but will still cover my ass. And then that's how I'll apologize. I didn't like the apology that she did because I was like if you're gonna write an apology like one don't do it on Twitter and two like I think she should have just been like oh like I don't have these views also you know? as a woman you should know <laughs> saying relax calm down right. <laughs> never makes anyone relaxed or calm down right yeah. so you know I wonder if like she did get guidance from a PR team to say that and then if she did I'm like who who are these PR people? Yeah. Like, how long have they been in the industry for? Maybe they've been in it too long. Um, sometimes I think, like, people in the industry, you know, if they're, like, Gen X or, like, older millennials, they might not understand, like, the landscape that we have today, and that can end up being a detriment to the people that they represent. Totally. And it's also hard to tell, too, what when celebrities do something, is that because their PR team told them to do it or was it just them? So like Mm -hmm. I imagine Sydney Sweeney fired off that tweet herself at the party. (laughs) And then I imagine Adam Levine sat down at a conference room and wrote up a little notes app apology for the Instagram story. But you never know who did what. Can you tell you think? I think so. I think if it takes a long time for it to come out, Typically, a PR team helped on it. I think Sydney Sweeney did tweet just a few hours after it happened, so I could see that coming from her. Um, and then I think it also, if it also de- involves more people, you're going to have a team weigh in. So anything involving that, like Taylor Swift, Kanye West, Kim Kardashian incident, it involves so many people. There's threats of lawsuits. You would include people. Sydney Sweeney, it's just her family members, so mm-hmm. I could see her just saying that from her gut. <laughs> yeah. From her southern heart. Yeah. <laughs> But I also think, like, a lot of people respond negatively to apologies if they think that a PR team was behind it because it comes off as less authentic. But then, you know, for Sydney Sweeney's case, like, people were also ragging on her for not having her PR team look over it. So, like, is there a sweet spot or do you think no apology is ever going to be good enough? I think it's different for different groups. And I think a lot of times people don't know what they want. There was this, uh, she's a Russian TikToker and... There was a scandal involving her where I think she said the N-word in Russian in an interview and she was saying that it was just Russian slang and other people, I obviously don't speak the language, were saying that it wasn't. And everyone was calling for her to do an apology. So she made an apology on TikTok. And I remember all of the comments saying, well, we won't forget. This apology wasn't enough. And it just seems like people's natural instinct when something goes wrong is apologize, apologize. Mm -hmm. But people don't take a beat to think, do you really want an apology? Or do you want to never see this person on the app again? Because, you know, it Mm. seems morally fair of you to say, well, all I want is an apology. You would sound so cruel if you said, I never want to see your face on this app again. But sometimes celebrities do apologize and it's never enough. Mm -hmm. But then once again, like you have all of America into question. A lot of these people probably don't even know about the scandals that are going on. Some people probably saw Don't Worry Darling and had no idea that (laughs) Spit or Shia LaBeouf was involved in any of it. I wish that was me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or I kind of don't, though. I like, I love the spit memes. <laughs> they were really funny. And I, my opinion on that is I think he did spit, but not like purposely. Yes. Like probably like a little bit came out, but not like, you know, yeah, like, he wasn't not a like targeted spit. He wasn't like a loogie, but it was like a little drivel maybe. And he is a spitter. He spits in his concerts all the time. Is this verified? Like, or is this a blind item? <laughs> the NT, at least from Crazy Days and Nights, says, and it looks like this in the video, that Chris Pine's sunglasses fell in okay. his lap, and that's why he looked down. Mm-hmm. But it's more fun to believe this spit, so that's what I spread. 
Yeah, see, yeah. like, it's also more fun to believe that Harry Styles <laughs> is bald. <laughs> He's just a bald spitter. He's like a llama. Yeah. And I think, it, <laughs> and I think it, like, goes back to one of those things where it's like, are these rumors, like, actually going to hurt a celebrity to spread them? Yeah, Harry Styles spitting, that's, gonna... that's fine. All these rumors <laughs> about Timothy Chalamet having chlamydia, that's a little bit different, you know? So there's, de- there's definitely a wide range. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think that's all the questions I have for you, Shannon. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I think you had, like, a lot of really great insight. (laughs) So I realized when I first recorded, I didn't um, film a goodbye, and it felt really weird to not have the video end with some kind of closure so here we go thank you guys so much for watching let me know in the comments what you think about celebrity gossip scandal over the years um also let me know if you want more people coming in as guests for some of my longer form videos obviously it doesn't make sense to have a guest for every single topic that i talk about but for this one i thought it was really uh fun to talk to shannon i think she's very smart and articulate and i was very nervous to talk to her as you can probably tell in the video but um if that is something that you think adds to the viewing experience i would love to hear it okay (laughs) um thanks for spending this part of your day with me i hope you have a good rest of your day and i'll see you later bye